Um, so I want to talk about that interplay in the marketplace of consumers, advocates, governments, producers, and how a lot of the things that we try to make happen in the marketplace, often with policy influences, um, how the marketplace might be a little different and might either complicate or provide opportunities for success in getting us to better health outcomes. And there's been a lot of debate about this. We, you can't open up the newspaper without hearing people argue about soda taxes or um, banning junk food in um, schools and all these policy discussions we're having. And the discussion sometimes people are talking past each other. And um, I could talk a lot about the different ways that people talk about this, but I like this picture here where there's this idea of, um, th there's really two poles of discussion, and one is about what I would call um, kind of a f social determinism around food. The idea that there's nothing you can do as an individual because the system has basically be been stacked against us to lead us towards poor health outcomes. Um, that the way we've designed our cities, the way that we sell, market, and consume our food, all these things are really driving us to poor health outcomes. And so we need to change everything about the landscape of this obes obesogenic society that's leading us um, astray. Um, and, and a lot of the research about the environmental influences on food choice and health outcomes support this. Um, but that completely diminishes and disenfranchises the role of the individual in this. You know, I don't want to live in a world where I have no control over what happens to me. Um, the other side of this is an extreme libertarian um, individualistic. This is about individual choice and about individual problems. Take responsibility for what happens. And uh, of course, individual choice matters a lot. But then that ignores the fact that what I choose is a function of what's available to me, whether it be in the marketplace or at a breakfast buffet. So somewhere in between, I think, is where the truth lies, that this is a false dichotomy, I think, this argument of individual versus social responsibility. I think there's both individual and social responsibility. Um, but um, and in fact, there's a complex system of influences on our food choice that ultimately lead to some of the health outcomes and, uh, and opportunities, uh, such as the one Stephen was just talking about. So uh, this includes the role of culture. You know, what we eat here is different from what people eat elsewhere, not just because of the availability of food, but because of the way our cultures um, view food. Um, obviously, economic resources in a household are going to influence what people can buy, what people have access to, the time resources available. So why is this a policy question? It's because this is huge. Um, there's a, a huge amount of health care costs at stake. This is the single largest part of uh, the economy in many uh, wealthy countries, and that is a main driver of a lot of the discussions we see, whether it be public health care costs or private ones. There's an increasing incidence of obesity and diet-related disease, um, and in many cases, dietary-related diseases have overtaken communicable diseases uh, as the top killers of people in most wealthy countries. A lot of international initiatives, there's popular concern. I mean, how many of you saw Supersize Me a few years ago? That was the most, um, that, that was the highest grossing documentary film until March of the Penguins came along, because nothing can beat a cute penguin. But, um, <laughs> but force feeding yourself french fries comes close. Um, there's legal liability issues, and we've seen the rise of lawsuits, particularly in the United States, around um, producer and uh, retailer li potential liability for food. And then public budget crunches make some of the possible solutions on the table a bit more politically palatable when, for example, um, you're in a province that's looking at sin taxes um, as a way of meeting revenue gaps, uh, as was part of the budget announcement this week. And then this, how many more needless deaths? I just give that as an example of part of the rhetoric that people use on this, because uh, editorial in the newspaper in the Edmonton Journal a few years ago, looking at uh, potential changes to dietary recommendations was using that language talking about the formation of dietary guidelines. How many more needless deaths? Which is the kind of thing we often ask when we say, why aren't we getting involved in this humanitarian crisis or something like that? Or why aren't we doing more to spread the stop of a disease? So people are using that same language to talk about our dietary recommendations. Um, and uh, as I alluded to, there are lawsuits at stake. And this was a big part of why I believe the popular media started paying more attention to the policy aspects of food, diet, and nutrition um, in the last several years. Uh, most notably, a little over 10 years ago, two girls in New York City um, suing McDonald's for uh, its role in, um, uh, in, in their obesity. So the scale might tell you when to sue. Um, 
So if we're not where we need to be, and I believe uh, you know, uh, Stephen's talk gave us some pretty striking examples of ways in which we're not where we need to be, well, where should we be going? Um, there's different takes on this. The World Health Organization's recommendations are a nice way of summarizing some of this, although not even, even these fairly general recommendations aren't without controversy. But limiting energy intake from fat and shifting consumption away from saturated and trans fats, um, increasing consumption of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and nuts, limiting consumption of free sugars, limiting salt, ensuring that it's iodized, that's still an uh, important issue in many parts of the world. Um, achieving energy balance for weight control, engaging in adequate physical activity. This is maybe in broad strokes some of the things that uh, many people would say we need to be moving more in this direction compared to where we are today. So if we're not there yet, if there are outcomes we want to see, things that we want to see consumers do differently, things that we want to see different in the marketplace, well, then there's two questions we should ask ourselves as we launch into these debates. One is what I call a positive or descriptive question. Can we formulate policies to improve consumers' dietary choices and reduce the incidence of obesity and diet-related disease? You know, what's effective, what's not? And a lot of research is being done right now on, you know, okay, if we change the prices of soda, how much less soda will people drink, and what's the health implication of that? But I would also make sure that this normative question of what we should or ought to do is part of this discussion. And, you know, what are the justifications for doing this? There's strong health benefits to changing diet, but does that mean policy is always the right part of the toolbox? And I think that just asking ourselves that might lead to a bit more honesty in these debates where people come at each other from very different viewpoints, um, arguing about uh, individual uh, policies. So what are the types of policies we see being enacted in the marketplace um, around nutrition and diet? Um, you know, what's the policy pantry? What, what, what's a toolbox for a policymaker or, or somebody advocating for increases in um, public health through nutritional changes? There's research and development policy. There's labeling and social marketing. There's marketing restrictions that you might impose. Uh, School-based policies have become very popular. Uh, in many countries, schools are a primary way of feeding children, but also it's a place where uh, young and developing appetites are um, within, uh, uh, in, grouped together uh, somewhat under the state's control. There's process restrictions or process mandates. Um, we do a fair amount of this in different contexts, and something like vitamin D deficiency has been a part of a process restriction here in Canada for many years with um, minimum vitamin D levels in fluid milk. Um, that doesn't mean that people are necessarily drinking the fluid milk, but when you do, there's a minimum amount of vitamin D uh, in each liter of fluid milk. Uh, the uses of taxes or subsidies to change the relative prices has obviously been a hotly debated topic lately. Um, behavioral economic tools or nudges, so changing the food environment because of all those subtle and important ways that uh, environments impact our choices, so, so should we change the environment itself? And then agricultural policy, the policies that are usually designed to support producers, um, do they have influences um, on what people end up eating and how they end up eating it? So I could spend hours talking about examples from some of these, and I'll just go quickly through a few points on this uh, to remind you or give you a bit of a flavor of some of the policy issues uh, involved in trying to improve nutrition. Um, one is around information and advertising. Uh, and this is something that I, as an economist, would call information asymmetry. When I look at an apple, I don't necessarily know everything about what's in that apple. What's the nutritional content of it? Um, are there pesticide residues on it? And so governments have gotten involved with labeling initiatives as a way of overcoming this information asymmetry. When you pick up a package of food and look at the nutrition facts panel, that's been designed to give information that's available to the producers, or which can be available to the producers if they hire a lab to do the nutritional analysis, and to share it with the consumer. Um, and of course, then, sometimes we wonder, and some people joke that we're drowning in information because of this, because uh, the panels um, seem to have a lot of information on there, and not everybody understands um, what that information means. Unfortunately, not even people who took a nutrition class the year before always know what all those things are, the recommended levels. And this information is being given, of course, in the context of media coverage on nutrition and food, some of which seems contradictory, almost random. Um, and uh, you know, a new study comes out, and how does that play in with the previous studies? And uh, those of us at universities involved in research also know that for better or worse, the studies that get the most play in the media are not always the ones that 
best represent the current understanding of the science. Um, so sometimes it's a matter of um, a slow news day or who wrote a really good press release that made it into the right hands. Um, so these mandatory labeling schemes, um, uh, people are familiar with what the nutrition facts panels look like in Canada and the United States. Um, and just many of you know this, but these are all highly regulated and hotly debated. What should go on there? What shouldn't go on there? What goes first? What goes last? What font do you use? Um, what order are ingredients listed in? And how are you allowed to aggregate ingredients when one ingredient is actually a combination of other ingredients? You don't go down to a chemical level. Um, you know, so uh, all these things are hotly debated, hotly regulated, and then um, not often as well enforced also. So that's a big, you know, how true is this even after we go through all the process of um, getting these labels right? Um, the, op the idea, of course, is that if you are given this information, then you can choose to look at it. You might use it to improve your health outcomes, limit your sodium intake, um, limit your fat intake, make sure that you're getting enough of essential vitamins. Um, but keep in mind that this is not just there to influence consumers. That often the biggest changes from labeling come from influencing product formulation. Uh, and the reason I highlighted this, the trans fat uh, line, when that was added in the United States, and it was an interesting backstory as to how that happened, is actually a case of uh, an agency in the United States that normally stops regulations, saying that they're too expensive or too complicated or not well thought out, actually going to the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration of the United States, and saying, why haven't you done this yet? Because our cost-benefit analyses, our bean counters say that this is a huge winner to tell people about the trans fat content in food. But the labeling didn't really tell people about the trans fat content in food so much as it gave producers the strongest incentive they had had to take trans fat out of the food formulations, if they could at all. And so this line's on most food items, or this line's required on anything that has a nutrition facts panel in the United States, and it says zero grams on most food items including on many food items that didn't have it, because it really induced a lot of product reformulation. So there are products that still have it. I have that information available to me as a consumer. But it put an incentive in the marketplace for producers to do things differently than they have been. Um, labels aren't necessarily just about providing objective information. Um, sometimes they're about stigmatizing. And here in Canada, I, we're very familiar with the idea of stigmatizing labels. The Lynch cigarette is not an objective health message Purely. I mean, that's about trying to say something about um, uh, your, what you want to be uh, your lifestyle. Pictures of um, pregnant women smoking or um, diseased uh, lungs and brains. I mean, that's designed not just to give information, but to gross you out or to tell you that this is an undesirable behavior. Um, and then, of course, there's voluntary labeling schemes. And the issue with voluntary labeling schemes, so they're voluntary, but then they also require oversight from governments because um, uh, what if people are making health claims that aren't proven or are completely false? So here in Canada, the approach has been to actually highly regulate the health claims people can make and really limit it for the most part to claims that have been well vetted. So it's more, you know, it's a list, and if you fit this, you can put that claim on there. Other places, it's more about litigating over false claims. Um, but some of these are also just about providing or summarizing information. The Guiding Stars program has been in Canada for a few years now. That's about highlighting certain food products on supermarket shelves with one, two, or three stars. And so just getting a star is already a very small percentage of the food items in the supermarket shelves, and more stars are better. And it's meant really to help guide people, uh, you know, should I choose this cracker or that cracker? And, it, you know, it's meant to summarize a lot of information. But they're very reductionist by nature because you're taking all that information on the nutrition facts panel and even some information that's not on the nutrition facts panel and reducing it to one dimension, zero, one, two, or three stars. So it's meant to be simple, but then you're losing some of the story. Uh, Nuvel is a similar system in the United States. Um, and you know, these show up on things like the food price labels in, in the supermarket. Um, and then the one on the upper right corner is an industry um, initiative in the United States where uh, companies highlight um, they have to report the calories if they choose to do the scheme and the sugars, but then they get to highlight two of their best nutrients in that product. And of course, that has led to concern that 
um, this might lead to a sort of nutritional whitewashing of products. That if I have a high fiber product, I'm going to of course put the high fiber content up there, front and center on the front of the package, but then um, that might mislead you into thinking it's a healthier product than it is if it's extremely energy dense and you're eating 10 bowls of the high fiber cereal for your breakfast and um, taking in perhaps a lot more calories or sodium uh, be because you're seeking out the fiber because somebody told you fiber is important today. Uh, other parts of the policy pantry, uh, marketing restrictions are a fascinating one. And here I have a nice uh, example that many of you might be familiar with. Um, you, know, you may have noticed that uh, there are some regulations about the marketing of milk in Canada. Um, and so um, the introduction of um, of partially skimmed milk, 1% milk, well that wasn't really something we saw on supermarket shelves uh, until uh, less than 20 years ago. And when that was introduced, and these are just time trends, uh, you know, so no real analysis other than the time trends in here, um, it took off. People started drinking the 1% milk and what's interesting is that it really didn't come out of um, reducing the non-fat milk. It, it seemed that, you know, the, the non-fat milk uh, was still being consumed. It came away from, people were switching from whole milk and from 2% milk to 1% milk. So if, uh, if, if reducing saturated fat intake is an important goal for some people, this seems like we were doing it, right? That this is a product that was made available in Canada and people started consuming it. But at the same time, there's also trends going on in how we consume dairy solids. And those dairy products per capita, um, some high fat uh, products were trending upward heavily over that same time period. The total cream consumption, um, specialty cheeses, if you think back over the last 15 years and how now you go into a supermarket and there's four separate cheese sections and the really expensive cheese and nicely wrapped and, um, you know, the uh, increased availability of different varieties of cheeses, um, those were going up at the same time. So, and it makes sense. On the one hand, um, we're taking valuable dairy fat out of fluid milk, but it's a valuable food input and it's making its way into the food system elsewhere in a variety of products that many of us find delicious and um, enjoy eating. Um, and so there's shifting who's consuming that dairy fat, but it's, it's a shift. So is this a total reduction in consumption, a total increase in consumption? No, it's just a change in consumption patterns. Um, and, and I don't want to overdo it on saturated fat. Saturated fat are one of those areas where there's not as much agreement uh, as those WHO recommendations might uh, suggest. Um, so another part of this policy discussion has been taxes and subsidies. And this is a hotly debated one that I've done uh, some of my own research on and follow the, uh, 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 the various policy initiatives fairly closely. Um, and, and the idea of sugar taxes is not a new idea. So Adam Smith, um, over well over 200 years ago, pointed out that sugar, rum, and tobacco are really good things to tax, in his opinion, because people, lo lots of people consumed them, but nobody needed them. So I thought that makes it a good place to focus your tax efforts, because it was a good way to raise money, and you weren't taking away uh, reducing access to necessities. So Adam Smith seemed like he might have been for sugar taxes. Um, but whenever we, why do we have taxes in the first place? There's three purposes of taxes. Um, one is to raise revenues for government. Um, and that's something that we might have been thinking about in Alberta a little bit the last week. Um, redistributing income. So the idea of progressive taxation to take a larger percentage of taxes from higher income people, of using taxes to raise revenue for programs that then might be directly used to aid um, the incomes of lower income households. Um, and influencing behavior. And the point with all this discussion, it doesn't matter what you have in mind when you talk about a tax. All, any tax does all three. And so if you have a tax designed to influence behavior, such as a soda tax, well, you're also going to raise some revenue. You're also going to redistribute income. If you're taxing things to raise revenue, you're also going to influence behavior. Uh, a nice example of this uh, comes from uh, the United Kingdom many years ago. An early attempt at a progressive um, wealth tax was a window tax. The larger your house, the more windows. With, you know, uh, 200 years ago, going in and having assessors uh, assess the property values wasn't an easy thing to do, but taxing property owners on the number of windows in their houses seemed like a, a first approximation at getting a little more money from wealthier households. And you let, it led to houses like this, where you'd frame out the window, so you had the opportunity to have a window in the future, but you didn't put 
the window in, because each window wasn't just the cost of installing it, but you're going to pay a higher tax. Um, so that's an example of a tax designed to redistribute income, a progressive tax, and raise revenues, influencing behavior in a very unintended way. There wasn't really a strong desire, we need fewer windows in the United Kingdom. We need fewer windows in England. Um, and, uh, and then some people claim that this led to poor health outcomes in terms of less ventilation, so I don't know about that, but still, um, it's a fascinating example of influencing behavior. So the idea of soda taxes or fat taxes, which usually by that people typically mean junk food taxes rather than taxing fat content directly, um, this is taken off in many places. Uh, there's been widespread calls often for medical groups and health advocacy groups. Soda taxes have been a particularly strong focus because, um, I mean, what's in a sugar-sweetened beverage? The only thing of nutritional value is the sugar itself, and it's a nutrient that we're generally trying to limit for many people in the population. So it seems like an easy thing to tax. Uh, but those advocating for these taxes would tell you it's not been an easy thing to do. Um, and, you know, so we've seen um, proposals in various places and provinces. It's harder to do in Canada uh, for a uh, variety of reasons in terms of how uh, tax burdens um, and taxing uh, what different jurisdictions are allowed to do. In the United States, you see famously some cities taking strong initiatives. So Baltimore had a small tax on soda put in in 2010 specifically for the purposes of meeting a short-term revenue gap. Um, in uh, Richmond, California, there was a soda tax initiative that was defeated primarily on arguments of the regressiveness of the taxation that had a, was going to have a bigger impact on low-income households. And then just down the road in Berkeley, the tax that was successfully put in with a lot of fanfare uh, a few months ago. And the folks in Berkeley now aren't really sure what they're meant to do with the revenues from that, and they're still trying to figure out what it means to have this tax. Um, on a broader scale, Mexico has a um, peso per liter tax that was just put in uh, about a year and a half ago, and so now there's, we're starting to see get some data on what the impacts of that might be. You'll notice that a lot of these the traction for taxes has increased in the last few years, not just because of a critical mass of people calling for these sorts of approaches, but because of a political receptiveness towards new revenue sources. A lot of these things in the United States were just sitting on editorial pages until 2008, 2009, when all of a sudden local and state governments were desperate for new revenue sources. And there's been other approaches on this. The Massachusetts sales tax proposal under the last governor was to lower the sales tax across the board on everything, but then to put it on uh, certain categories of groceries that had been exempted before. So in Massachusetts, as in many jurisdictions, you don't pay sales tax on a soft drink that you might get at a grocery store, but you do pay sales tax on something you might take from the salad bar, because that's considered a prepared food oven. So if you run in for lunch and grab a salad and a soda, you're paying sales tax on on the salad but not the soda. So the idea of kind of trying to reduce these tensions that seem to be um, having slight tax preferences for less healthy foods um, while still trying not to redistribute the income as much. Um, and in Ontario, many people know that um, uh, a while ago, uh, the attempt to extend the provincial sales tax to low cost uh, meals, prepared meals, failed horribly. It was seen as a very regressive tax. And not only did that um, exemption for meals under $4 uh, remain, but then when Ontario participated in tax harmonization, in order to keep that low meal, low cost meal exemption in place, they had to come up with a way of making that work with harmonized tax. So in Ontario now, technically what happens when you go and buy a $3 meal at a fast food restaurant is you are paying the harmonized tax on the full amount and then you're getting an instant rebate on the provincial portion of it. So, you know, to keep this exemption in place, they had to go through these uh, machinations. Um, so can this work? Um, again, it's hotly debated, but consumers do pay attention to price. So when prices go up, we buy less of something. But with food in particular, the price responsiveness overall is fairly muted. So we don't reduce our consumption a lot. Um, these are what we call low price and elasticity. So that means that if you put in a small tax, you're not going to have a big behavioral change, but you're going to raise a lot of money. Because if people aren't changing their behavior, it means they're just paying the tax. So um, like gas tax, uh, gasoline taxes and alcohol taxes, it's a good way to raise revenue. Um, but the evidence on actually decreasing the incidence of disease or um, changing body weights uh, has not been very uh, positive when you try to come to the health outcomes. Um, 
Another approach for taxation, which hasn't been really implemented in, 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 as far as I know uh, in any major way, is to have input taxes uh, at the producer level um, or, or the product formulation levels because, uh, you know, product, uh, food product manufacturers pay more attention to the cost of their inputs on a general basis than individual consumers pay to the cost of any one food item. And then another question all this, so what are the distributional impacts and what are, what's the distribution of behavior? Who changes their behavior? When you look at a study and it says, if this were to happen, people would change this by behavior by 3% on average. Nobody's changing it by 3%. There are some people who are very responsive to that change and might change their whole lifestyles about it or be doing something fairly well, and other people who have very little or no change. And that creates impact on who benefits from the health uh, benefits for policy and who does not. So if I want to borrow from Michael Pollan talking about food, I'd say there's three simple rules of tax and consumption food. People respond to food price, but not too much, they mostly pay. Um, and so and then who, who, who pays and who responds. Um, and what those responses are might not always be what you want. And I, this, I, okay, I'm being a little extreme here. I don't think people are going to start breaking into the local max to steal Snickers bars at 3 a.m., but um, in Wisconsin, um, a few years ago, the feds increased the price of uh, the, the taxes on cigarettes by about a dollar a pack, and a few months later, many states, responding to the fiscal crises in 2008, 2009, increased cigarette taxes as well. Prices went up by $1.75 per pack on average in Wisconsin, and all of a sudden, somebody was stealing a lot more um, uh, cigarettes. Again, prohibition uh, in the United States created a very vibrant underground economy for alcohol. People do engage in these types of behaviors. So less extreme than breaking windows or, um, or uh, the establishment of criminal organizations to trade Snickers. Um, Cross-border shopping was a big part of what was seen in Denmark with the, uh, with the Danish saturated fat tax. Um, people in uh, Chicago, which has a higher cigarette tax in the city, in Cook County, than in surrounding counties, go out to the burbs to buy their cigarettes. That is a common thing to do. Um, people coming to visit Alberta buy their electronics in Alberta and don't have to pay as much in, in sales tax. So people do respond to incentives, but they respond to the incentives that they face, not always the one that's intended by policymakers. And so again, there's a lot that still needs to be understood about this idea of changing food prices specifically to change behavior. Um, and consumers generally seek out close substitutes. So if you focus your taxes very narrowly, the health impact becomes limited because people will have substitutes that, you know, tax my soda but not my juice, and then I might go to juice sweetened beverages and product manufacturers might get clever about formulating things that would avoid a narrow tax. Go to a broader tax and then it's a much bigger tax grab, uh, but you might have bigger behavioral impacts. Uh, behavioral economics tools, this idea of looking at the food environment, the things that influence the food environment, that some of which you heard about earlier this morning, and trying to use policies to then change that. Perhaps in subtle ways that can have big impacts. This is one of my favorite studies and I'll go through it very quickly here, but the idea behind some of these, or the holy grail with some of these, is can we get people to make healthier choices without actually taking anything off the table for them? So what if you go into a restaurant, for example, and if you, with the same menu, the same options uh, of sandwiches or something else available, and just, you highlight different items. So you have a featured item section. Here's a very simple study where some consumers saw a menu, and the featured items were all low calorie items, some of the featured items were all high calorie items, some it was a mix, and otherwise, so nothing else changed on the menu. So nobody was telling you you couldn't buy uh, a, a cheesesteak sandwich or that you had to buy um, something. And huge differences in what people choose to buy. The percentage of people choosing the low calorie sandwiches when those were highlighted, 70% versus around 30% when the high calorie ones were highlighted. Just by you know, what goes on the front page or has a little, um, you know, a little extra color around it. These types of things, subtle, can make huge differences. A lot of interest in these same things in terms of designing school and workplace cafeterias and with, without even changing the food available, just changing how you present it has had big influences on what people end up choosing. Um, ag policy is a hotly debated one and in the interest of time I will go past most of this and just um, summarize some of the research literature that's looked at this. Of course, 
and there's a lot of blame that people put on agricultural policies about uh, the consumer impacts. These, these policies weren't designed to hurt consumers. They weren't particularly designed to help consumers. They usually have production-based goals in mind. But a lot of literature really suggests that there's low price impacts, that the existing supports don't have a big impact on the price of things that consumers are paying in the supermarkets. And that some of, the, you know, some of those price impacts have negative consequences for health. Some have had positive consequences for health. And overall, this is not the big driver that people think. That the, you know, the idea that um, changing the corn subsidy program in the United States is going to change the global makeup of, um, uh, of sweetener availability, I, these things, that's a bit overstated. But the R&D policy has likely had larger impacts than we actually give credit for. That you know, the issue with something like high fructose corn syrup isn't so much the price that producers are getting to support their production today as the fact that we develop those technologies uh, to access those sweeteners um, because of incentives that were in place in the past. And just changing the price supports now isn't going to change the availability of these sweeteners. Um, producers, the producer response in this is very important. We often focus on what we want consumers to do more or less of. But producer responses can have huge positive or negative impacts on the health outcomes we might see. The introduction of new products to meet consumer demand, to meet new policies, uh, the way the products are marketed, what's promoted. When, when the tobacco prices went up in the United States a few years ago because of these increased tax levels, the, ci the cigarette manufacturers targeted the price promotions on the states that had the largest tax increases at the time. Um, and, and genuine proactive health promoting shifts are possible either to stave off undesired regulation, to stay ahead of the regulatory curve, or to differentiate your product from other products in a world where consumers are paying more attention to the nutritional content and the nutritional implications of their food choices. Um, and of course, there's some policies. The policies that can get the most traction are those where uh, folks, uh, where the health advocates, consumer interests, and producer interests all align. So it's a lot easier to get folks from fruit and vegetable uh, trade associations, marketing associations, to support some of these initiatives and for other products. Or the picture in the lower right might uh, be a little unclear as to what I'm getting at there, but um, the, the, the calories count messaging on soda machines and the distributor's willingness to promote low calorie messages on the soda machines seems perhaps a little counterintuitive, but it's not. Because once somebody's at that soda machine, you know, Pepsi or Coke doesn't care what they buy. Buy the Dasani. We're selling it for the same price. So they don't have to go and say anything negative about their other products. They can just remind you calories count because you're already at that point. It's unlikely you're going to walk away from the vending machine because somebody's put a sign up there saying choose a lower calorie option. So some of these are the things where it's easier to get consistent messaging. And um, obviously, though, the low-lying fruit is limited in availability, and not all the fruit will be low-lying. So I'll, I'll sum up here. Um, you know, policy interventions are not medical prescriptions. I think a lot of the discussion we see often comes from people looking at the science of nutrition and medicine and the health outcomes and then wanting fixes through policy and want to write a prescription for a policy the same way you might write a prescription to a client um, who's in your office. But the marketplace is an even messier place than the, than the human body. Um, and so these policies may sometimes not go the way you intended, either for better or worse. And policy changes produce winners and losers, and the winners will line up to promote for a policy, and the losers will line up to fight against the policy. And that's a consistent part of the way that these things play out. Um, any policy has winners and losers behind it, particularly in the marketplace. Um, and people do respond to incentives. The use of incentives for improving nutritional outcomes is uh, a, a very promising area to look at, but they, look, they respond to the incentives they actually face. And unless you understand the differences in individual producer and consumers' lives and, how they're, and what they really care about, then you're going to miss the mark. 